everyone. I'm Scott King, and that is Luther Birdsell, our Chief AI Officer over at Krista. How are you, Luther? Doing well, Scott. Great to be here with you. All right. Yeah, thanks for uh, joining this version and this edition of the Union Podcast. Today, we're going to talk about the demand for AI and data science skills that that may or may not be required, you know, inside your data science team, if you have one, and if you don't have one, like, do you really need a $900,000 AI engineer? So this kind of stems from a Netflix job posting. It was picked up a couple of different times uh, over the past couple of weeks where they posted a job for, I believe is a product manager, like AI product manager, in the salary range, because it's in California, they have to like put an actual range was three hundred thousand to nine hundred thousand dollars. So obviously that is, you know, with stock and all kind of benefit payments and everything. But nine hundred thousand dollars seems like a lot, Luther. Do do you really need a nine hundred thousand dollar AI engineer? So, <clears throat> Scott, I, I it, it would certainly be an exceptional circumstance um, that uh, that you know that that kind of payroll commitment. Uh, re- really yielded maximum uh, uh, optimized or maximized shareholder value for that organization. Um, so not not saying that it's impossible, um, but but certainly uh, would lie in a, a very small small minority uh, of cases. Yeah. So if I mean everyone wants to put some type of AI into their business, whether it's you know just use generative AI in the sales and marketing department. Or maybe I'm using some type of predictive analytics for forecasting or cash flow analysis. If someone wants to implement AI, is this going to scare them off? Like, because they can't compete with, uh, they can't compete with nine hundred thousand dollars. Like, not everybody can do this. Scott, so a lot of this is classic innovators' dilemma. Um, you know, the the really small comp- you know, the really big companies that have these enormous balance sheets um, have. Uh, have made, you know, exorbitant financial commitments early in other financials, you know, in other technology cycles and, uh, you know, and not wound up coming out on top, um, <clears throat> you know, but by virtue of having those resources and, and some of the other dynamics in play there, um, they, they tend to use them as we, you know, we kind of move out of the global 2000, the fortune 500 and global 2000 and, and kind of down into the middle market, especially down into the lower middle market. And then even, you know, beyond that and into smaller businesses, as we move down that spectrum, these options just get more and more limited, and that has always forced small business to be more creative about how they resource um, kind of any kind of problem, especially technology. Uh, and that's you know, kind of the essence of innovation and, and where, you know, the smaller agile companies uh, can, can really have an advantage. Every, almost everybody needs AI and a building sentiment you know, to remain competitive now, you know, the ice cream shop, uh, my, you know, my barber pro- certainly don't need it as soon as, you know, some of these bigger, uh, you know, other companies. Um, but if we kind of just focus on like medium sized businesses, companies, you know, with revenue, maybe over five million dollars and then up onto the biggest companies in the world. There's this increasing imperative, Scott, that nobody wants to still be only talking about AI on January 21st of 24. Like when this calendar year changes, if you're not doing something, there is this kind of building consensus that those are the people who are behind. And your typical technology cycles that that we're all used to, um, you know, kind of crossing the chasm uh, lays this out nicely. But, you know, you've got your your visionaries, like the first to do it. Then you got your early adopters and literally crossing the chasm is starting to sell to the mainstream. And you get this big mainstream population and then you kind of get into the laggards. Well, AI is is kind of presenting, and I always love how John says, um, you know, you can be earlier, you can be late. AI is is looking increasingly binary on that adoption spectrum. You're either going to be like off the X doing something and on, in the group that's moving towards pulling away, or you're a laggard. And this kind of like, we're going to wait for the mainstream, we're going to de-risk our investment by letting everybody else kind of figure this out first. Um, is looking less and less like that's going to be a uh, successful strategy in AI. So anyway, short, yeah. short answer, Scott. Yes, there is increasing pressure building to be doing something with AI uh, now or very soon. So if 
you know, if people see the the engineer, you know, the expensive engineer job, they they may or may not be scared off. Clearly, they can't do that, right? Um, but if they don't have that kind of budget and they do want to get into AI, um, you know, like many of our customers, they don't have data science teams, right? Uh, or if they do, it's in a completely other part of the business, right? Um, not in on the automation side. So what if, like, what do they do? You know, if you say if you say January, I I don't know if you said first or twenty first. I couldn't I couldn't hear. But um, you know, what from from today until then, if you're not doing AI, what what do you do? Do you um, do you do this in a, a low risk situation? Uh, do you hire somebody to help you figure it out? Like what what would you advise people do? So Scott, first thing, just because a company can um, try to brute force AI with exorbitantly priced resources doesn't mean that they should. Um, <laughs> so uh, that that piece first. So so this uh, the answer to the question really applies to everyone, whether they have the option to you know deploy hundreds of millions of dollars to hire many many data science teams or not, is is to start with the right strategy. And from what we've seen, you know, what I've seen in the market over the past decade of, you know, being like lip deep in AI um, is that when organizations focus on automating the learning process instead of kind of get distracted by using this really complex technology to automate human tasks, that there's a big differentiator there. Um, and, you know, face value, you know, surface value, it might, it might present as just semantics, but let me kind of walk through an example. Yeah. So, like what is, what do you mean automate the learning? Yeah. I'll, I'll give you an example. So whether we're a medium company, whether we're, you know, a medium company or a big company, a data science team, whether there are employees or, or we outsource them, um, it is going to have to set this up and, and whether we're using large language models or traditional machine learning, you know, that there's some kind of data that we are going to present to some kind of machine learning or AI model, that's the input, and then we're gonna get some kind of outputs from this. Um, an output might be predicting a number, telling me what something is, it could be a summary of a document, um, or, or you know, there are many, many other things, especially under that large language model, but we'll, we'll get to that. So you, you need some folks to set this up. And once it's set up, by kind of the default um, pattern in organizations is that that data science team then needs to basically stay married to that project to continue to update, to improve it, or even just keep it just as accurate as it already is, which means you then need to hire a second data science team to do project two that basically gets entrenched in that, and a third one to do three. Only the big companies can really afford to do that when those data science teams are, you know, typically one to two million um, annually or more. If you're again trying to grab really, really premium resources, and just very few companies even have the option to do that. And again, when you compare this to one data science team starts the first project, they move on to the second project, and every once in a while, you know, maybe once a week they get a suggestion, they get a notification from the system that, hey, you know, we've we've updated the model, you know, using the same pipelines and everything that they use to set up project one. Um, we've updated that model. We It's scoring better than the model that's currently in production. You know, please take a look at this. And they have their reports and all the stuff that they set up um, to help them compare, you know, the models that, you know, on the path to the first production deployment and they can then look at that. And we bring a human in the loop to apply that expert judgment. It takes 10 to 15 minutes. And then they can either say, keep working on this and let me know next time you think you've got something better or press a button, press, you know, the other button and it automatically replaces, updates what's in production. So we have one data science team now that can go do 10 projects, can deliver, maintain, and continue to optimize 10 projects instead of needing 10 teams to do those 10 projects, wildly different cost basis. Um, the big companies who try to brute force that are likely to get passed by the medium companies that are gonna be generating a lot more velocity. And you know, we think about regular software, right? Humans wrote code, humans updated code. That's regular software. We introduced machine learning, which is some of the code, you know, the really like valuable tricky logic. Um, 
and that's machine written code. But by default, that's updated manually. That gets really expensive. That's the model where you need, you know, a data science team to both set up and then own and stay attached to each project that you do. When you can automate the process of updating the computer generated code, now you've got an organization that's learning at automated, at automated machine speed and a company that is learning at uh, manual human speed is not going to be able to compete with a company that's learning at automated <clears throat> machine speed for long. So completely different cost basis, but it also results in a competitive, it also results in an acceleration to the improvement of the business and the learning in that business that a big company doing it manually can't compete with a much smaller company doing it in an automated way. And that's really where the value is in AI. AI is the first technology, you know, in, in the history of computing, in the his, you know, history of computing, that has the potential to really learn on its own. And when we can tap into that, that's really what's so special about AI. You know, we all hear so much about AI automating human tasks. I mean, the IBM AS360 in the 1960s automated arithmetic changed the world. And software, as it's continued to improve and computing's improved and we've gotten better at writing the software and all, we just automate increasingly sophisticated human tasks. But that's what software's always done. That's not the really unique special value driving part of AI. It's automating, it's when we can automate the learning process. That's what changes everything. And, um, you know, if you can bring someone in who can automate a learning process and enable you to do a lot with a very small team, that's a very valuable resource. It's also a scarce resource. So potentially for some organizations to bring in that kind of expertise, they could conceivably get that, you know, get get a big return on a small team of potentially really expensive people. But the reality is that there are there are AI focused um, orchestration platforms in the market today that are able to understand the inputs to these systems understand the outputs to these systems, which by the way, in every regulated industry we need, that's an audit record, um, and then use that exact same data to automate the training process, automate the learning process, excuse me, of, um, of these AI-centric solutions. And, you know, yeah, you can build that yourself. You know, other folks can, you know, maybe companies assign a lot of value to that. I mean, it sounds cool. People are, we have customers who've reallocated over $100 million of budget uh, to a more self, to a self learning strategy, uh, diverging from that manual one that they were planning, uh, they had some initial success with, and were planning to scale. Um, when you can bring in, uh, if, if you were to repeat, so if you build technology that your competitors can buy, you do not create competitive advantage for your business by doing that. On the other hand, if you can bring in technology that allows you to get a lot more done faster potentially even enabling like power users to participate much more in the process of connecting the systems in the business with the data in the business, with the people and the AI, then your engineers, instead of building a tool that all your competitors can just buy, can actually focus exclusively on creating the kind of intellectual property that creates real competitive differentiation. The first companies to do that are in the strongest position to create really sustainable competitive advantage and true moats around their AI technology. Those are the big companies that are gonna stay big and get bigger. Those are also the medium companies that are gonna displace some of the current big ones and become big themselves. Yeah, or um, you know, come become big themselves until a bigger company with a larger budget just acquires the, the competitor, right? Because they've gained so much market share um, you know, and started, with the automated learning process, I mean, it, it makes sense, right? I mean, that's yeah. why some of the software companies get gobbled up. Right, but um, that, that's a huge win for that medium business now. Oh, just yeah. created massive shareholder value because that big company is going to pay a big premium to acquire yeah. that technology. Um, so that that's a massive win for the shareholders of the organization that adopted, committed to, and executed a real AI strategy centered around that automated learning. Okay. So yeah, you, you may or may not need the expensive engineer, right? Um, but kind of shifting gears, um, yesterday in wall street journal, you know, we're, we're starting to see like, you know, from the software perspective, we're not talking about the enterprise, 
uh, perspective, but some of these, uh, the AI companies are experiencing employee churn, right? And, and, and da the data scientists are included in there. Uh, there are a couple mentioned in the Wall Street Journal article that, you know, that we'll link to. But why, why do you think that is? I mean, is it, is it they're just selling the hype and they're not, you know, they're not able to sustain the cost structure or, or, or why do you think that is, right? Because every, if everyone's buying AI and the AI companies are doing layoffs, that doesn't make sense. So uh, f from a distance, Scott, I agree that it doesn't make sense. Um, but if, if you kind of get into these, like, you know, bubble dynamics, right? There, there's been a speculative bubble that has just moved from one, you know, moved its focus from one thing to another since, since the Dutch tulips in the 17th century. Um, I mean, you know, through our careers that there've been several, right? It was dot com and so I mean there there've been there have been many. Um so the fundamental problem with AI is that the way most people are doing it is too expensive to create real value for most businesses. Um and again, that's kind of like the brute force mechanism, which which really is is logical if you try to do AI the same way you've always done software. Um, but ignoring the fact that software was humans explicitly programming rules into a computer, there was a ceiling on the complexity that we can do with that. And then everything was always manually updated in typically on an iterative basis. Again, it's, it, it's a fine point on semantics, but like to practice in the real world, it, it's, you know, a chasm apart, how you optimize value, how you maximize value in an iterative manually centric process is very different from how you optimize value in a highly experimental. So like iterative, maybe we like touch the code five times and you know, kind of move on. Experimental, we can run hundreds of thousands, millions of experiments with all kinds of configurations of data on all kinds of configurations of all kinds of algorithms. And, and that can get, I mean, it's just, it's a completely different thing. A lot of folks got away with building really good software without using automation. Yeah. Virtually nobody is getting away with delivering high value AI without heavily leveraging automation because it's so much, there's so many more things you need to try along the way. And that's just getting it set up. The reality is then to keep it in production, to keep it just as accurate. And ideally everyone wants to get better. It's just, there's so much that you have to do that you, nobody can keep up with it manually, no matter how much cash they throw at it, which is really why, like, you know, when you look at, yeah, AI is still software. But there's aspects of it that absolutely mandate that we automate a lot of that experimental process. When we do, that creates a lot of value. But that's not, I mean, you know, look, we all read the same articles. That's not how most folks are approaching this. That's not how folks are talking about this. That's not the start. That's not the, st hasn't been the starting point for a single customer conversation that I've had in this calendar year. Wow. Wow. That's powerful. Um, well, I appreciate it, Luther. Thanks for kind of walking through, uh, you know, this story, I, I thought it was kind of interesting because I thought, Hey, you know, if somebody's going to pay that much for a person, the little guy is never going to be able to afford that. Right. Right. Uh, but they're still going to be doing something. They have to figure out a different cost model to deploy AI. So, um, so any, any last thoughts, anything you want to leave us with? Yeah, I, Scott, I'd, I'd say for anyone, any size organization before they commit capital and especially before they commit a lot of capital to really walk the dog, you know, the, the military calls this walking the dog and understand not only the cost to get to production, but the cost of ownership because the cost of ownership of AI is so much higher than traditional software and organizations that think they're going to be successful with AI doing it exactly the same way that they did traditional software are uh, not only spending a lot of money, but they're also losing critical time. And uh, yeah, so that's uh, that's the word of caution. Before uh, before you go try and manually brute force an AI implementation, um, make sure you understand the role of how of automation or the lack of automation is going to impact the total cost of ownership of that project. Okay, I appreciate it. Well, thanks, Luther, for talking to me on this episode of the Union Podcast, and uh, I'll check in with you next time. All right. Thanks, Scott. See you soon. All right. Bye.